Okay, uh, very nice to see you all. Uh, I'm very grateful to fr uh, Frank for uh, making this opportunity for me to come and share with you uh, a few thoughts related to uh, mainly developments in open seas that were undertaken over the last 10 years by um, my group at UC San Diego. There are many other capabilities in open seas that of course for structural and also for geotechnical some of them are not by my group and uh, in the few minutes that I have today I just wanted to familiarize you as best as I can with the things that we have been developing you might find them useful. Uh, some of those are um, things that um, are related to getting more familiar with uh, the formulation that is needed for example for or can be used for liquefaction analysis and some are related to uh, just um, that um, you might be interested in modeling ground um, in a uh, nonlinear uh, hysteresis type response environment and so there are soil models that we have developed that allow some of this work to be done so that you could do, do nonlinear soil response. Um, I will also take a few minutes as best as I can and try to run uh, some graphical user interfaces that we have developed uh, to uh, essentially simplify the use of open seas for the purposes of our own work uh, as you will see. And uh, the idea is that uh, instead of preparing uh, a tickle file, an input file, um, and then asking OpenSeas to execute the file and then getting files of output that maybe you would use MATLAB to plot. Uh, this user interface, this graphical user interface helps you to prepare the tickle file, the input file, uh, automatically calls OpenSeas to do the computer analysis and when the run is finished it also has a post-processing capability to uh, display the outcome and show you the displacements and accelerations and all kinds of stress strain responses and so associated with the soil part uh, and the structural part. And then finally, uh, PEER has funded us in the last uh, two or three years to work on um, with other uh, PEER researchers, uh, primarily Professor Kevin Mackey, to integrate these geotechnical and structural um, graphical interface capabilities with capabilities in performance-based earthquake engineering uh, that PEER has been working on and Kevin in particular has developed so that uh, instead of just doing the finite element part in open seas, after the results come back, these results are taken into a whole set of algorithms that translate these uh, numerical outputs, different accelerations and displacements and so forth, into consequences for engineering related, for example, to what is the cost of repair of a bridge, uh, how many days uh, are needed to repair the bridge after a strong earthquake and things of that nature. Um, uh, people who are familiar with this performance-based earthquake engineering frameworks, uh, I think might follow this better. But also there is a graphical user in interface for that. Uh, if I spend time telling you how many hours and days and months and years people have been putting in this work, we won't get done in a half an hour. But um, for many years we were not including Frank's name uh, on our presentations uh, just because it was implied that nothing happens without Frank. But uh, we keep on, you know, always relying on Fla Frank and calling uh, on him for help. Um, Dr. Jin Shi Lu has been working with me for many years and he's the main developer of uh, the graphical user interfaces. And Dr. Yang, um, uh, who works for Caltrans here in Oakland, uh, has also been a main developer of the soils capabilities. Um, he finished this work more than five or six years ago now, but he's still a resource and we uh, uh, touch base with him all the time. Many other people, but no time to acknowledge, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, the first thing is the graphical user interfaces. I just again want to transmit as much information as I can in the few minutes I've got. So you see this website, uh, 3 W's soilquake.net. Uh, if you go there, you will uh, find uh, three or four different interfaces that we have been developing over the years. The primary one of them that is um, totally integrated um, with the Open Seas framework and, the, and a finite element analysis capabilities is this Open Seas PL, which is a domain for three-dimensional analysis of ground. 
with the capability of having here uh, a bending beam, if you will, in the ground and above the ground with a mass on top for many different applications. Because if you change that, the size of this object, then it can become a building. If you make it small, it can be a pile and anything in between. Um, and you could do this analysis uh, with uh, many different soil configurations. And so you could see soil structure interaction characteristics and so forth. Um, and um, again, in this uh, soil quake, there are other uh, uh, interfaces that we had developed in earlier times. One for simple idealizations of an earth embankment, for example. One for 2D plane strain analysis with a superstructure. And one for um, you know, programs like SHAKE, if you are familiar with site response, ground response during earthquakes. Uh, but it does all the analysis in a fully nonlinear framework with capabilities for liquefaction. This program is known as Cyclic 1D. Uh, and then, as I just mentioned to you now, the program that is now um, running for a simple bridge structure with um, supported on ground and with uh, uh, models for the abutments of a bridge and so forth is this program Bridge PBEE. We just uh, a few months ago uh, released this website. And if you go to this website, you can register. This is a website that is sponsored by Peer. You can register and then download the software and there are some solved examples and some capabilities to uh, walk you through the steps. We're looking for people to maybe um, give this a try and uh, send us their feedback. It's very useful to really um, uh, get a better understanding of how performance-based earthquake engineering is done in general, because after the numerical part is done, then all the steps that are involved in performance-based earthquake engineering uh, are undertaken all automatically within this interface and the results are displayed this way. Okay, so there are several examples. After we prepared everything, we thought that the initial examples might be best done on uh, a rigid base. So some people might just be interested in seeing what is happening to the superstructure of the bridge, the column, and responses on the both sides of the abutments. So you could look at situations like this with a rigid ground, or you could look at situations like this with the entire uh, bridge and uh, a very large soil mesh um, that is um, supporting it. Um, there are many examples on this website as well. Um, so uh, it's always a good idea to look at the examples first. And then with, uh, as I heard Frank also suggesting to you, you really want to start simple. So uh, the best really way to start is to take one of these examples and make one single small modification to the input file and then run a different case. Please refrain from trying to change too many things at the same time. You might be fine, you got yourself a whole new mesh with different parameters and so forth, but it becomes much more difficult to really track and understand why did the results change in a certain fashion if you change too many things at the same time. Your best bet is start, change one thing, and run and look at the new analysis. And let's say, for example, you're changing the height of the column of the bridge. So the column was short and stiff. Now it became tall and flexible. And you, then you could run and compare the outcomes based on that change in that now this is a much more flexible bridge overall, for example, and see what happened. Much easier to track this way as opposed to changing the property of the column and the soil under it and three or four other things. You will get an output, but it will be very hard to understand what's behind the different responses and the changes in these responses. So um, as I meant to mentioned to you, we had some um, uh, developments in open seas related to taking some <coughs> elements that are in, were in open seas, uh, if you will, available just for general purpose of continuous media, either in plane strain analysis or in three-dimensional brick type elements. Um, and we adapted those so that they could work for liquefaction, which means that if I have a saturated ground above the water table, the, I can use the elements as they are, just dry soil. But below the water table, I want a saturated element that has an additional degree of freedom that represents how the water interacts with the soil. And this additional degree of freedom, uh, in our analysis, we took this from some people who have been de developing uh, this since the 1990s. We decided that pore water pressure 
is this additional degree of freedom. And so the displacements are at any node um, are represented by this uh, uppercase U. So this is displacement, uh, X, Y, Z displacement. And then P stands for pore water pressure. And this formulation is known as UP formulation. We took that, as I said, from the 1990s work of, of some people in England, uh, among them Professor Chen and um, people who are still working on these things. There are other couple, so-called coupled formulations, solid fluid, um, and uh, certainly could be implemented. But this one appears to be adequate, or more than adequate, even for liquefaction analysis and applications in earthquake engineering. Um, so these are the elements we have now. If you go to the Open Seas Wiki under um, the command manual uh, section or the element command section and you scroll, there are many, many commands, of course. But in some subsection of this now is where our elements are. So we try to group them recently under UC San Diego, UP element. This is again the displacement pore water pressure element, as you see here, which is useful for saturated soil. In uh, 2D plane strain is the four node elements. In 3D, you could use the brick elements. And there are several versions of these elements uh, that offer you uh, different capabilities and might work better for different applications. Again, for starters, um, we have some examples that you could track and then uh, start from there and modify them for your application. OK, so the elements look something like this, for example, in 2D. You see for, uh, uh, a quad element has uh, four nodes. And on top of the four nodes, then this red circle shows that we have also four pressure degrees of freedom that are added to the displacement degrees of freedom of this element. Um, we also have this higher order element, which is nine degrees of freedom, uh, or nine <coughs> nodes for the solid phase, and four nodes for the fluid phase. This is an element that works better for um, uh, most of the time, actually, for liquefaction problems. And this is, uh, it takes a bit longer to run. But this is why we had to implement these higher order elements, like the 9-4 quad. And again, UP is displacement and pore water pressure for saturated ground. The same for the three-dimensional situations, eight degrees, of, uh, eight nodes. Uh, for the solid, eight nodes for the fluid, but that might not work well for some cases. And so there are this higher order element, many more nodes for the solid and uh, eight nodes for the fluid in um, 3D. OK, so um, we actually were working on these things many years ago in our own local code. And then when Open Seas was initiated, it was an excellent opportunity to uh, capitalize on all the terrific capabilities on open seas and all the additional elements that you know do an excellent job on structural response and so forth and integrate this with the soil work that we were doing and so that's really was the beginning of our involvement and um, the soil models we had been working on were uh, soil models to reproduce nonlinear soil response hysteretic response cyclic loading earthquake response uh, and some of them well adapted to situations of just ge uh, generating hysteresis so that uh, you know, we can better model damping in soil and accumulation of deformations in, in soils. And the other part was related to situations where liquefaction or pore water pressure buildup is a factor for sands and loose sands and so forth. And so again, these are, if you go to the ND material command uh, page in the wiki, we try to group also our uh, work here under UC San Diego work. This uh, pressure dependent, there are two pressure dependent models and one uh, pressure independent model for hysteresis, as you see here. <laughs> OK, so um, the first type of analysis, which I highly recommend when you start in the beginning, choose a linear uh, property for the soil, just so you see if things are linear, does the response make any sense? And even with linear, for some situations, if the soil is really not a terrible soil, you don't have to choose the uh, shear modulus that really represents the linear behavior. You could choose a shear modulus that is somewhat less than the initial shear modulus, and that already represents very roughly and crudely some level of nonlinear response. For example, if you say, 
I'll choose the shear modulus that is half the initial one or less than half the initial one. Then you're getting a material that is weaker than the original material. It's still a linear run. You will see something better than linear analysis. And it's a good way to track your work before you change into the nonlinear mode to see what is going on. Okay, the next, the next model is this hysteretic model. As you see, the, res the response becomes hysteretic as you see here. This thing can take five minutes. I've <laughs> um, so um, again, with the logic known as multi-surface plasticity, um, uh, the relationship uh, to reproduce hysteretic response like this in 3D uh, can be done. Um, these surfaces, um, if you are familiar with um, this so-called uh, principal stress space, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, look something like this, look like cylinders, where this axis here is the confinement axis, or the effective confinement axis. And since you see that the size of these surfaces is constant with confinement, this is where this so-called pressure independent response uh, came from, which means that the stress strain response, if the confinement is this much, is the same as stress strain response if the confinement is less or less or higher. It doesn't, does not change. As you will see in a second, the pressure dependent models actually change uh, the strength and the stiffness of the material with confinement. So you see this became a cone instead of a cylinder. And as the confinement decreases, the strength and the stiffness decreases of the soil. So the remaining logic to do liquefaction is to account for, well, what happens when I start shaking loose ground is that uh, pore pressure increases, and that pore pressure reflects in reducing the so-called effective confinement, which is the confinement, actual confinement between soil particles. So um, all kinds of logics were developed to account for this, so that if you're doing shear stress versus shear strain, you start, as you see here, and you can see cycle after cycle that the soil is getting weaker. Or if you look at this effective confinement axis, you start here and you start cycling in shear, and eventually you're moving towards the origin here and losing all confinement. When you reach here near zero, that means all effective confinement is lost and the soil is liquefied. There is an added uh, layer of, of complexity in the soil response in that um, actually even if you are accumulating this degradation of soil strength and so forth, the sand particles or any spherical particles if they're interacting with each other and you, they're sliding one on top of the other, at some point if you try to slide them too far, you could see now here my hand, they will have to climb one on top of the other to be able to move farther. And so as you do the shearing, at large enough shearing, you start finding that the particles need to climb on top of each other, which means that the whole soil mass actually tries to grow in size. We call this try to dilate. And if it tries to grow in size, it has to suck water in if it's saturated to be able to grow in size. It tries to grow in size, water needs to come in. And during an earthquake, there is just not enough time for the water to come in. And so what happens is that the thing starts freezing and fighting because it's trying to climb. The water isn't coming in to allow it to climb. And all of a sudden, even though it was a soup, all of a sudden now it regains strength and stiffness and starts fighting like you see here, for example, from two to three, or as it was starting to do from eight to nine, till you reverse loading, now it doesn't have to climb, it goes back again and becomes a soup, uh, and then it depends on what happens in the other direction. So all these logics are as best as we could built into the soil model and are available to use. Uh, some are really neat and uh, very helpful in um, predictions related to how much deformation happens due to liquefaction. So not only do we find that, okay, the site liquefied, but we try to come up with an estimate of how much horizontal deformation will happen if there is a slope or something of that kind leading to horizontal deformations. Uh, these slides are just showing, again, you could see that these are back again to the 2000s or even some experiments from the early 90s. So we've been at this for a very long time, trying to calibrate these models. And so some of the properties that we have in our manuals 
about what to use for a loose sand, what to use for a dense sand. The properties are coming from calibrations like this over the years, from centrifuge experiments, and from data from actual earthquakes where there were accelerometers at ground surface and at different locations within uh, the depth of the ground, what is known as downhole array accelerometers. And from insights like this, we, you know, as best as we could, calibrated our models. This calibration is good for today. I'm sure in five and 10 years, it will improve. Um, I wouldn't say it is totally off today, but I also would not say it is extremely accurate. And also, as you know, soil is a natural material, so there are no two sites that are identical. And what you would want to think of those as just representative properties for loose soils, medium soils, or soft clay, medium clay, and stiff clay, but they're really not exact for any particular uh, actual scenario. If you really want to go this far, you need to do your own tests and do your own calibration, which is also permitted and possible. So we've used these things for uh, studies, you know, under peer over the last 10 years. We started in 2D, as you see here, with some good work with a bridge um, on uh, a large uh, soil mesh in 2D. And then we migrated to uh, 3D with that same structure. Um, and it was a very uh, informative study. And actually, it was also an, an environment to encourage everyone to see, you know, what might be missing here and there so that open seas can execute things like this. And eventually we were able to do this work. Um, as I said, this was a multi-year effort, not something that is done, you know, um, overnight. And also included in the work, the best um, soil element, uh, the best uh, structural elements that are available, this so-called fiber formulation that I'm sure you, if you have not heard about, you will hear about shortly that represents the steel uh, reinforcement behavior and the confined and unconfined concrete behavior and includes this to model the piles underground and to model the structural elements of the bridge and the pier of the bridge and so forth. So everything is done, you know, with the best possible cyclic loading elements in structure and in soil to uh, look at the response and to get responses that include the formation of the bridge, not only because of the superstructure considerations, but also because of the support considerations and the embedment of these supports in the ground. So for example, um, in exaggerated form, uh, after the earthquake was over, you could see that there are deformations to the bridge, but also deformations to the supports and the final locations of the different pile groups is not the same as when they started. These pile groups are embedded in soft ground, and as you do the shaking, they actually move. And uh, in some cases, most of the trouble in the end, for example, if you look at the both ends of the bridge, is not because of the accelerations um, that came from the earthquake, but it's because of that the final displaced shape of the foundation uh, is uh, so far away from its original location that that causes huge st uh, permanent stresses in the structure and might dictate most of the repair cost. Okay, um, this is just showing you know, a situation where we tried to model a very large pile group, a 32 pile group in a bridge known as Dumbarton Bridge here in this area. Again, you know, just attempts to handle bigger systems in 3D environments to see uh, some useful outcomes. For example, um, if you look at a system like this, you find that the pile that gets the most punishment in a very large pile group is actually that corner front pile. Um, this pile might end up having to handle trouble that is five times one of these inner piles, for instance. And that applies to just own weight of the bridge and then also applies to forces from lateral loading once the bridge starts vibrating. So uh, this graphic here is showing the relative contribution of uh, load to the different piles in the pile group. In the center here, this is the center line, this one here or here, because it's 32 piles, we're only doing 16 piles because of symmetry. So we're looking at half of the pile group. And you see the corner pile, even under static loading, is carrying 2.3 times compared with the inner pile that is only carrying 0.3 uh, of the total load. And then you compare that to the outer piles, but not corner piles, and they're carrying about half as much. And then when you start applying a lateral load 
uh, on this pile group, that corner pile, as you see here, um, is carrying 5.2 compared with inner piles that are carrying much less. In the front here, you're adding to the compressive loads from the own weight of the bridge, but because you're causing additional compression in front, you start causing tension in the back. And so at the end of the load that we have applied, you could see that these back piles have changed from being in compression to this red color, which means that they have changed to being in tension. Tensile forces in this case in the back piles are even higher than the compressive forces due to own weight of the bridge. So you change the nature of the loading in the pile group from being just a system carrying compressive forces to a system that is carrying much higher compressive forces, but also tensile forces in the back part of the pile group. Um, I'm you know, more focused on geotech, but when I saw these numbers, uh, it starts sending messages that um, one has to really be careful that maybe the damage in the pile group is because of the tensile forces, much more so than worrying about some horizontal force acting on the pile. Just the pile gets pulled out of the ground and it might tear from the pile cap or something like this. Okay, so this user interface that can be used for studies like this is known as um, OpenSeas PL, this graphical user interface, and you already have the website where you can download it. Um, you could use it for simple environments without the pile groups and just to study ground response in 3D if you want. There are capabilities where you would say just remove the structure and you just end up with the soil mesh itself. And you can use it, of course, for simulations related to um, the uh, pile and the ground. Um, as I mentioned to you, uh, you could do linear also analysis part for the um, moment curvature of the column or the pile, or you could use fiber elements and do moment curvature, nonlinear moment curvature this way. Um, and then there is a library of soil materials here with properties that are already um, built in if you want to use. Or if you want to make your own, anything that starts with a U like this is a soil model that allows you to enter every value of soil property that you want. And you could start with one of those and then change. For example, if this one says friction angle is 30 degrees, U133, then go here and change that friction angle to 33, things of, of that nature. Um, We have a few other bells and whistles to allow um, simulations of all kinds that are not just related to the pile alone. So uh, you could see here different colors just si uh, signify areas of the mesh that you could immediately change the properties of. The material inside this zone, the material that surrounds the pile and the ground, and things of that nature. So you could see, you know, you could do shallow foundations, deep foundations, and so forth. Uh, we used this recently for a study of ground modification. Uh, you know, when the site is liquefiable, before they build on it, they might put stone columns or might put gravel drains. So uh, we could simplify the mesh this way easily and look at si situations like this. And since, you know, they do this in a pattern, you could just take a piece of that pattern and use something called periodic boundary and look at the response of a site with a very simple three-dimensional mesh of this nature. And um, here is uh, the work related to this um, bridge PVEE uh, framework. So the idea is to actually have a bridge on ground with the abutments similar to a situation like this, ready to model with a user interface so you don't have to spend too much time building all this mesh. It gets built for you easily. And then uh, use the results that come and PBEE involves that you actually take this system and subject it to hundreds of earthquake motions, some small, some medium, some strong, and then look at the response over all this range of different uh, shaking levels and start making assessments about if the shaking is small at my site, what are my expected repairs? If the shaking is very strong at my site, what is the expected repairs and downtime and so forth? So uh, this interface allows you to uh, run more than one earthquake at a time since you, run, you have to run 100 earthquakes or more. So you don't have to run each one and wait till it's over. You, uh, you know, with the 
multi-core machines that we have now in PCs and so forth. Uh, you can run many at the same time to save time. And then um, you can look at the outcome. This is showing, for example, um, the drift ratio of the bridge as a function of peak ground acceleration of the different earthquake events. So maybe here there were 100 earthquakes. Each one has a peak ground acceleration. And what is the corresponding drift ratio of the bridge, maximum drift ratio, due to uh, each event as represented by its peak ground acceleration? This is known as an, an intensity measure in the PBEE language. You could look at that against 20 different intensity measures, peak ground velocity, peak ground acceleration, and 18 other uh, measures that are there. And then you could translate all this to repair costs uh, based on um, your assessment of what is the cost of concrete, what is the cost of doing this, what is the cost of doing that. So all this is part of the PBE framework. And then you finally can see uh, the result here in dollars against peak ground velocity, for example, of the different earthquakes. If my shaking includes peak ground velocities of that order, then the dollars that will be involved in repair are of this level. If the shaking is out here, then the dollars increase, as you see. And we have this here shown by category of component of the bridge. So here is something related to the abutment and the repair of the abutment. Here is something related to the column and the repair of the column, and so forth. And then, of course, if you want the total cost, you just add all this up and see things in terms of total repair cost, as you see here. And you also get a plus and, plus and minus one standard deviation around the uh, repair costs. Because, of course, nothing is certain. This is all probabilistic framework. So you also get a standard deviation around your estimate. The same applies for downtime. Cr uh, CWD means crew working days. So there are estimates, again, of how many working days are needed to repair the bridge. Again, this is for low levels of shaking, and this is for moderate levels of shaking, and this is for very high levels of shaking. Did I run out of time? I still ran out of time. Uh, OK, let me just take a second quickly. Um, I just wanted to show you that there are different models that are already embedded for handling the interaction between the bridge and the abutment as well, in addition to the column. <coughs> you could choose any one of these models. They are ready to go. Um, this was an example, and there is no time for that. Um, the system is very versatile. For example, we're using it now to look at, there is something called uh, ground, ground remediation by cellular uh, enclose, uh, encasement of the liquefiable soil. So instead of trying to get the soil to become stiffer, we just encase it in uh, a cement soil mixture, this way in the form of a rectangle. And that helps a lot in um, uh, getting, getting liquefaction to be mitigated. So again, that can be done with the interface by specifying an additional material outside. Uh, very convenient to do. Let me just quickly show you. Uh, let's try this one, just any one of these. So this is an example if you use the, this bridge interface. This is how it starts. And you could modify things very easily. This is. Um, the mesh here, and these are some of the you know simple graphical capabilities. Capabilities. Um, let's see if we can, for example, uh, refine the mesh quickly. So this says uh, number of slices. Let's try to make this. Uh, I don't know something, you know, a bit more, so we can see if it will change it. Okay. So this is a good example. So you can see the um, uh, value of this interface in that if you made a mesh and you want to modify it, you just push a button and you get a new configuration. And of course, you know, you can change the height of the column, the width of the column, anything and everything is done by just changing a number here and there and you get a new mesh. Uh, so I don't encroach 
more on other people's time, I'll have to stop here. Um, and um, I think I started with my email and on the first slide, so be happy to respond to your mail as much as I can if you like to contact us. Uh, here it is. Okay, thank you very much.